In the first part of this series, we learned about how San Francisco's Chinese fought exclusion. In this part, we'll visit the Mississippi Delta, where Chinese community has played an unexpectedly important role. The Mississippi Delta, home of the blues, endless fields of green, and a land cultivated by the hands of slaves. But in between, for more than a hundred years, the Delta has also been home to a small but influential Chinese community that's been navigating an identity that's both American and Chinese. This is Sally and Gilroy Chow, and this is their 46-year-old walk. We heard about these dinner parties they throw to get together with friends and eat Southern-style Chinese food, like fried rice with lots of bacon. So we decided to go meet them and find out how their families ended up in the Delta. This is a store that I grew up in many, many years ago. We lived in the back of the store before we bought another house. Like most of the Delta Chinese of the time, Sally's parents opened and ran a grocery store. The Chinese originally came here to work in the cotton fields. With the end of slavery, plantation owners could no longer depend on the free labor of slaves. So they looked to the Chinese, who were cheap, disposable, and politically voiceless. But with harsh conditions and little pay, working in the fields didn't last long. They soon started opening grocery stores in small towns up and down the Delta. I mean, it was a phenomenon. When I think about how, how the, the Chinese came and just settled in the Delta, from Memphis to Vicksburg, I mean, just look at it. It really filled a particular need because nobody else wanted to do it. These stores played a uniquely important role in the segregated South, serving the black community when the white community wouldn't. And this was significant because it meant more than 70% of the population got their groceries and everyday goods from a tiny Chinese community. Frida's family store in Min Sang started out in the 1930s as two different buildings across the street from each other, one serving black people, the other serving white people. Neither black nor white, the Chinese community found themselves in the middle. It was like a three-lane road. Um, there, there were the whites and the blacks and the Chinese. We all stayed in our lanes and we were fine until we crossed over. <laughs> the Chinese grocers depended on the black community for business and also served them in very practical ways. Like when Jean's father's customers couldn't pay for their groceries right away, he let them use credit. People didn't have that much cash and so he would have credit and they would come in one week, pay a little bit on their bill and take out more. And that was just kind of how they survived. This kind of trust was essential because of the economic burden non-whites faced. Where Jean grew up, the median annual income for whites was just over $4,000, more than four times the median income of non-whites. Over dinner, Sally and Gilroy's friends had plenty of grocery store memories to share with me. What was the worst? The mop, the mop and the floor. <laughs> <laughs> On Saturday night. Everyone, that was a unanimous <laughs> When you were old enough to be able to see over the counter, many of us started working in the store. It was just expected of us. Living and working alongside our mom and dad was seven days a week, morning until night. I mean, even Christmas Day. They opened 365 days a year. You know, there's one thing I didn't even realize. During the Exclusion Act, the Chinese were not allowed to own property, so they lived in the back of their stores. Even when exclusion ended in 1943, many families couldn't afford to buy a new home. We lived behind the grocery store, one big room divided into two rooms. We didn't know anything else, so we thought it was kind of fun. But you know, as we went to school and realized people had homes, we thought, well, that's different. When it came time for Frida to go to school, it was the first year that the town she lived in, Greenville, allowed Chinese children to go to white public schools. Prior to that, all the Chinese children had to attend this one-room schoolhouse. Some of these schoolhouses were built by the Southern Baptist Church, which remained a big part of Delta Chinese life. Lord, we just ask for blessings on this food, bless the hands who prepared it. Even with their busy lives between the store and family, the Chinese still found time to get together for celebrations, dances, and of course, food. There was a definite camaraderie with the kids 
uh, in the Delta. It could be a birthday party or a wedding, whatever. They would have uh, dance. We all just love getting together and the food was always phenomenal. Here we are. We're all lonely in the grocery store and there is absolutely nothing to look forward to. And, and so you can imagine that, I mean, he, here, here was something, a social event that the Chinese could, could really look forward to. For many years, the community thrived in the Delta. But over time, as more farm jobs were lost to machines, unemployment increased, and so did poverty and drug use. Chinese-owned grocery stores became easy targets. My brothers, I mean, th they have been victims of, of uh, two armed robberies within the last few years. Luckily, they have survived. We just don't even wanna, we just don't even wanna think about it. Today, most of the Chinese grocery stores are closed. The end of the Exclusion Act brought new work opportunities and the original grocers fulfilled their duty of working every day of the year to send their kids off to college. Many of their children grew up to be pharmacists. Some served in the military, like Sally's brother, Audric, and Gilroy worked on multiple Apollo missions for NASA. But even though they've been here for so long, the Delta Chinese are still often seen as outsiders. I had an occasion to where I was walking into an office building and some dear little lady said, honey, she says, are you ornamental? And <laughs> I didn't quite know how to answer her. And I said, sometimes. It happens to me all the time, you know, like, how long you been here? Or, who taught you English? Because, are, are we the, are, are we always foreigners? I mean, that's, that's a great question. I think about that myself mm -hmm. all the time. Are we always foreigners? Mm -hmm. Because of our, because of our appearance. Because of our appearance, we just look like we just got here. I mean, we don't look like American people. <laughs> Despite these interactions, for the Chinese community here, the Delta will always be home. Oh, Audrey, why do you love it out here? It's so peaceful, you can't, I'll turn my cell phone off and uh, so I'll just fish and uh, nobody's calling me. It's just solitude, enjoying God's creation. <laughs> Sally, Gilroy, Jean, Frida, and Audric. These friends are some of the few Chinese left in the Mississippi Delta, but they remain a close-knit group gathering over food to preserve the memory and legacy of their families. The Chinese American people definitely made a contribution in the Mississippi Delta. They came and they definitely made a, a big contribution here. They did. If you like this episode on the Mississippi Chinese, check out the next one on St. Gabriel Valley, where new immigrants are completely changing the restaurant scene. Even Chinese people think they have the best Chinese food in America.